I want to welcome Greg Pennyroyal, who is with Wilson Creek Winery. He's the vineyard manager there, but he's also a professor, professor of viticulture at Mount San Jacinto College in Southern California. Thank you, Greg. Hi, Keith. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, Dr. Jones, that was a great presentation. We will be talking. There's, I, I totally agree on the soil temperature thing. There's a lot of things that are changing rapidly. Um, what I would like to focus on is this is actually a really nice follow up to Dr. Jones's presentation is how do we get some of these concepts and how do you start to actually apply it to a farm? So I do have somewhat of a research background, but despite the owning of one clean shirt, I am a farmer primarily. Uh, we're doing about 170 acres here in the South Coast in a region that has experienced a lot of heat in the recent decade. And so um, this might be a potential for what's going to be happening in the North Coast. So let me open up this presentation and go to the beginning. And uh, there we go. So can everyone see the presentation properly? Um, we're actually looking at your presenter view instead of the full slide. Let me go to... Uh, Sorry about that. Oh, here it is. Use presenter view. Get rid of that. Try that one. Does it look better? Perfect. Yes, looks great. Right. So um, what I really want to talk about is with climate change, I think what we really need to look at is resi resilience. And you get resilience through biology. And I am defining the increase of biology as basically using the principles of regenerative ag. Um, I want to talk a little bit about carbon, carbon sequestration and regenerative ag, and specifically some examples, some of the benefits I've seen as a grower, and some thoughts about how to get into this, because making a transition from industrial ag into regenerative ag can be a challenge, and you need to do it carefully, so um, you know, you're, you're benefiting and you don't go bankrupt in the process. Uh, this is a field of echinacea up in Trout Lake, Washington. That's Mount Adams in the background. Uh, that was my first major venture into agriculture, Trout Lake Farm. It was the largest organic herb farm in the U.S. of 2,400 acres. Um, I later did, was the director of botanical research for Liner Health, which was a division of Pfizer and their natural products division. I uh, spent 15 years with the U.S. Pharmacopeia developing standards for medicinal plants, which is part of the reason why winemaking was so interesting to me is uh, whenever we would talk about chemotypical expression of the microbiome in plants, I would inevitably get much better questions from winemakers than I generally got from pharmacognosists. Uh, some of the research we've done is in the National Institutes of Health. I uh, did some interesting work with the Global Institute of Tibetan Medicine on the same thing, looking at standardization of medicinal plants. I am currently the vineyard manager at Wilson Creek Winery and a professor of viticulture at MSJC. Um, I think Dr. Jones covered this really well. This is the South Coast mean temperature for um, the last 100, uh, 100 plus years. But if you look at this trend, it's, um, it's, actually, it's clearly in an upward direction. And if you were to graph this, the rate is climbing quite a bit. Um, the South Coast ABA is sort of similar to the North Coast ABA in that we have a lot of um, ocean influence here. Our diurnal shift is still pretty good. Um, I think it's our saving grace, but as the oceans warm up, I think we might get a change in weather patterns. Um, it's hard to predict whether it's actually going to get specifically hotter, specifically drier, uh, specifically wetter. I think what's going to happen is the trends are just going to become more severe. The heat events are going to be hotter. The rain events may not be as, um, as much of a volume of rain, but we've noticed that the events are short and tend to be really hard rain. So let's do a quick comparison of industrial agriculture versus regenerative ag. So the basic theory is soil as a medium for delivering soluble nutrients to plants. Um, that has led to a degradation of the soil food web. It also generally releases CO2 
and decreases stable soil carbon. It does this through a degeneration of organic matter. Um, this is a larger public policy institute, uh, in issue, and I was glad that people, you know, one of the questions that came up is how does this work with other crops? I think as viticulturalists and anyone in agriculture today, if you look at the degradation of overall public health, a lot of that has to do with the drop of nutrient density in food, and that has a direct correlation with the microbiome and the biological expression of, um, of uh, the soil that's feeding the plants. There's also an ecosystem services degradation. Um, we're, we're currently working with our local water district is they had millions of dollars put aside to uh, develop land for recharge. And my question to them is why not just help the local vineyards create strong biological soils so the vineyards can be the recharge. A biologically active soil will actually clean water and the water will enter the, um, the watershed cleaner than it came in. Um, also, you, it, industrial agriculture has an increased reliance on synthesized inputs and that's pulling money out of your pocket as a farmer. You compare that to regenerative agriculture is the soil systems are constantly improving soil health. It supports the food web. It sequesters carbon, it builds organic matter, it increases the possibility of nutrient food, nutrient dense food is medicine. And that's sort of the connection that I have of having started in medicine and seeing the public health implications of um, loss of the ability of the microbiome to deliver nutrient dense foods. And it decreases or eliminates the reliance on synthesized inputs, which will improve your bottom line, which brings me to the issue of regenerative agriculture must also regenerate your farmer's bank account. If you don't have a good margin, you're not gonna have a mission. It also must perform in current economic models. Um, what I mean by this is there are a lot of models that are based on what's called true cost accounting, which basically says that if you're externalizing costs like water pollution, like CO2, loss from the soil and those things, that your actual economic models may not be as good as they look because those costs are put off into the, into the general public. But that's not the system we're in. So it needs to work on those true cost accounting models. Um, hopefully when we get some correction of this with things like carbon credits, that this could be a help and some of the benefits that a good regenerative farmer is providing to the community could be actually paid in cash, but until that happens, it still needs to work out. And that's the value of ecosystem services, clean air, water, open space, genetic diversity, and the potential for carbon sequestration. So if you wanna change how you run your operation, I think the first thing you need to change is your perspective. So the Regenerative model is that all plants have evolved in a highly complex mineral, organic, and biological mix. There's a theory of biological availability that basically says it's not so much that things are soluble, but they're made available biologically. Um, there's some really interesting research currently going on um, under the title of rhizophagy, uh, which is happening, I believe it is uh, Princeton University. But anyway, it's an interesting concept to look up and I would highly recommend it. Um, maintaining soil health is sustainable agriculture. You know, we hear these terminology issues of regenerative and sustainable. And I think the reason why a lot of us are going to regenerative versus sustainable is if you currently have a system that's degrading soil, that's losing water, that isn't increasing organic matter, that's not what you wanna sustain. Most of us have inherited degraded systems to the point that we probably need to regenerate them, not just sustain a system that uh, currently isn't working. The opposite of that is the theory of solubility. That's the basic chemical model. It's the NPK approach to fertility that assumes that the parts are greater than the whole. Large scale commercial interests support this. And the challenge with this is it works. It's somewhat like anabolic steroids. Um, they achieve great results, but only in the short run, and then degeneration and damage sets in after that. 
So this is sort of how I look at regenerative ag as the sort of core issue here. Is the photosynthetic is plants, we talk about soil health a lot, but the truth of the matter is, is that plants are driving the system, not the system driving plants. So plants functioning at a higher photosynthetic efficiency are the engine that develops soils, not the other way around. Uh, there's a lot of work that says, on average, most crops are working in their pure theoretical photosynthetic efficiency of about 15% or 20% of their theoretic genetic potential, which means that we're leaving 80% of that value behind. Now, of course, realize that unless you're in a greenhouse under perfect optimal conditions, you're never going to get to 100% because there's heat stress, there's drought stress, there's you know all sorts of biotic and abiotic stresses. But we can increase that ratio from 20% to quite a bit higher. And what happens when you do that? Well, it does correlate to increased yield, but it's not always just the yield. When you have increased photosynthetic efficiency, a lot of that efficiency goes into sugars that then feed the soil ecosystem. And this is a really important concept because the model that a lot of us learned years ago was that it's sort of a closed system and the more inputs you um, put into the system, the more yield you get. Part of our yield has to be feeding the biological system that then sort of primes the pump. It gets the whole system going. The more the system is primed and going, the more it self-regulates. Uh, the additional sugars are improvement in the genetic expression of the actual vineyard. You get higher chemotypical expression, which is a technical way of saying you get more balanced fruit. Uh, some of the examples of a um, more biologically balanced vineyard is the acid sugar ratios tend to be a little more balanced. The nitrogen in the grapes also tend to be on the amine side. In other words, the um, ammonium and nitrates are forming into amines and then amino acids and more complex amino acids, which actually really help in fermentation. That's what creates a slow, steady, um, solid fermentation versus a sort of spike and crash that we sometimes see with our grapes. Um, improved plant health and resistant to biotic express, um, biotic stress, excuse me. So Part of that resilience is cover crops and mulches. They're in the vineyard dormancy period. Uh, vineyards are dormant classically when we get our Mediterranean winter rains. Don't let your, your crop, um, you know, your soils be bare during that. That is an amazing time to collect solar energy and then feed it into carbon increase into your soil. Uh, under the values of cover crops, this is a photograph of my uh, Cabernet Sauvignon vineyard in last year. We had 15 inches of rain. You can see that the cover crop is a multi-species cover crop. It is pretty much up to the cordon. It has grown really well and it is um, it's just producing a lot of organic matter and pumping a lot of sugars into the soil. This is that same vineyard this year where we've only had 2.2 inches of rain. Obviously it's not doing as well, but with that little bit of rain I have, I still have a cover crop. It's still covered. I'm still gonna get mulch. I'm still gonna get carbon out of it. Huh. Uh, Greg, you're cutting out. You uh, might I'm try- I'm not sure what happened with that. Yeah, Greg, this is Keith, your video is a little crackly, maybe try turning off your video and try. Okay. Oh, we can see it. How's that? Yeah, you're, you're still cut out. Maybe maybe move to the next slide. Maybe that slide is an issue, or I don't know. It says you cannot start your video because your host has stopped it. 
Yes, I disabled your video, Greg. This is Ashley. Um, just because we're having a hard time hearing you, so we cut out your video so that we have less bandwidth on your end. Um, so go ahead and try and try and speak. Your your screen is shared. We just don't have okay. your face. So perfect. Or John. Okay. Um, let me. Okay, so the bottom slide is a vineyard that we just started. Um, we did a cover crop. It has not been in a regenerative system. And you can see the difference. Um, even though the cover crop on the um, top one is, is obviously nothing like it was the year before, we're getting almost no growth out of the cover crop from something that wasn't in a regenerative system. So this is some work by uh, John Kemp at Advancing Eco Agriculture um, it's called the Plant Health Pyramid. And basically what it's saying is as plants become more healthy, they move up this photosynthetic pyramid. And um, what it says in the bottom is you get complete photosynthesis. On the next level, you get complete protein synthesis. As you move up this, you get more resilience. So at complete photosynthesis, you are building some carbon in the soil. At complete protein synthesis, you're getting a lot more expression of the plant's natural immune uh, properties. And it becomes ins more insect resistant. The further up you move, the further the genetic potential of that plant is able to express in an ecosystem and able to express um, favorably with biotic and abiotic stresses, you know, heats, insects, and all those things. Resilience to biotic stress goes up as you go up that plant health pyramid. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with the work of Elaine Ingham and the Soil Health Food Web, but this is basically what we need to consider when we're doing this, is as you increase the levels of plant-driven um, complexity in the soil food web, the ecological homeostasis builds in. And what that means is the plant is communicating with the soil food web, the soil food web is feeding the plant and you get that whole system going. For me, this is the goal of regenerative ag is to get that system going. Uh, this is a classic plant succession um, diagram that says going from pioneer plants to a climax forest. And I think as viticulturalists, a lot of us sort of forget, well, where does Vitus vinifera fit in? And I think most people would say probably somewhere in the shrubs or woody pioneers. But the truth of the matter is, is that Vitus vinifera is actually a climax forest ecosystem plant. Um, it evolved in what's now modern day Iraq and Iran, and it evolved, it co-evolved with oaks, using the oak as a infrastructure to get up to the sunlight but also surviving in that fungally dominant, highly biologically active oak forest, you know, savanna oak forest ecosystem. So with that in mind, when you're managing the ecosystem of your vineyards, you have to sort of ask, what are the goals? One of the tools that I use is to use a diversified cover crop to increase soil diversity. As my soils become more complex, I go for more simple mixes, more grass-based, oat-based mixes, more legume mixes, and um, you know, I'm sort of pushing that, um, that complexity more towards the fungal diversity. Uh, this is a great tool that I use, it's called Smart Mix. Uh, it's from greencovercrop.com, I believe is the company. But if you look up Smart Mix, it's a great tool. You can take a look at what your um, goals are, whether you're trying to increase organic matter, um, fungal growth, nutrient cycling, um, you know, whatever those goals are, and you can play with different mixes, and it'll tell you how those mixes are going to influence your goals and what the cost per acre is, so you can help to calculate the return on investment for that. A quick note on agriculture and carbon sequestration. If you look at all the other forms of life, everything from amoeba to um, arachnids to humans to um, fish, 
this is the potential of carbon sequestration that they have as compared to plants. However, these aren't in the same scale. Plants have so much more of a potential to sequester carbon that if the plant scale was on the same as these others, it would look like this. That's how much plants have the potential to sequester carbon. But especially in warm soils and vineyard soils, you realize we're not just trying to sequester carbon. One of the goals of sequestering carbon is to um, lose it. You want that carbon to be recycling all the time. Greg, Greg this Keith, uh, everything looks good. You got 10 minutes. Thank you, sir. So I'm getting pretty much near the end. Keith, the taskmaster is keeping me on target. Uh, this is mint field up in Oregon. Um, talk a little bit about what's worked for me. So soil tests, um, the right kind of soil test, especially with a saturated paste test, um, I think give you a good indication of where you're starting. I would not my run my, facility, my fertility program with a soil test. One thing I will add to this is we started doing the Haney um, CO2 respiration test. Um, so far, um, the results of those tests much closer correlate to what I'm observing in my vineyard, whereas the actual soil tests, I see a low correlation. Once again, that's more like potential. Ideal samples, I got to say, I just really don't use them anymore. Um, I don't find much of a correlation. Part of the problem with ideal samples is it's testing the entire tissue. It's not telling you what's in the sap. It's telling you what cumulatively has been in your tissue as an early indication, early fruit set, possibly. But aside from that, I really don't use them anymore. The tool that I do use that I've been finding remarkable results is sap analysis. Uh, some of the insights, so this is uh, just a couple of slides of some of the sap analysis that we've done over the course of a year. And each one of those lines represents either an old leaf and a new leaf on a sample that's taken twice a year. A quick example of some of the things that we saw here is we saw the sugars early in the season being low and being quite erratic. And the question is, why am I not getting better sugar metabolism or photosynthetic efficiency? So taking an example of iron, we looked where we got a bump in the iron from one of the foliars, but then a drop, but then it increases as the temperature increases and we started to, um, to do a different irrigation schedule. So the question was, is the iron not being taken up by the plant because of um, the soil temperature? And you would think that at higher temperatures, your soil temperatures are going up. But what happened at the point where these soil temperatures went up is I started irrigating on a regular basis in the evening. It was the slow feeding of the grapes and the soil temperature probably dropped. So to connect with what Dr. Jones says is we're now putting out over 20 soil temperature sensors in our sensor base to take a look at that relationship to not only water uptake with soil temperature and not only phenological cycles of the plants, but the nutrient uptakes of the plants. Uh, some of the other tools that we're using is a system called eVineyard. Um, there are some tools out there, it's just the one that I use. The important point here is you need to have decent tools for data collection. Uh, this is one of the data collection tools that I really like. It's called EraWatch. It's a satellite-based technology. This is a 4th of July, 2020. The red indicates areas where I have heat stress. Um, it will give me an ETO reading. It'll give me a photosynthetic efficiency reading. It'll give me soil temp, air temp. It'll compare some of those. It has some algorithms that I can compare those. But what I like about this is a couple of these representations. So this is an overall stress. I can show this to my crew and we understand where we need to adjust the irrigation on that. As a comparison to this, this is that exact same field, December 31 after we had a rain, obviously really low stress and it's picking up a lot of the photosynthetic benefits of a cover crop. The information that we got from the whole concept of soil temperature and possible oxidation reduction issues in nutrient uptake are leading us to have um, more control over our irrigation systems and possibly more plentiful fertigation in our systems. 
So this is a four acre block that we've divided up into four one acre sections that we are going to be doing sort of a proof of concept that says if we are mulching this entire field and we are gonna compare foliar feeding with fertigation and monitoring the soil temperature with the soil respiration and nutrient uptake. We wanna know how those things correlate. Once again, this is more of a proof concept because the controls I have are actually off-site controls, so there'll be decent controls for proof of concept, but not exactly publishable, uh, publishable material. So what benefits have I enjoyed? Um, my increase in my third year biological um, blocks have been 22 to 31% on average. But here's actually the most important part to me, is yield stabilization. In 2020, uh, the Cabernet Sauvignon in the Valley had a 65% of three-year average yield. So in other words, the yield went down substantially. We do running three-year averages. If you look back on five-year averages, it's pretty stable. In the blocks that I had on a regenerative program, I still yielded 110% of my three-year average, which is a little bit statistically off because, you know, obviously I'm getting an increase in yield. But the main thing to this was the yield stabilization. I'm also getting better quality. We're getting better ratings on our points. Our winemaker is happier with the fruit. Um, and you can just tell, you, you know, as, as viticulturalists, when you're out in the field, you can just taste your fruit. You can see and taste when it's doing better. Part of the expression of that being better is this is a picture of Malbec and you'll see that it has these large clusters and not um, any real small clusters. This is the expression of the primary buds and the apical buds. In other words, the, when the buds develop, they have two primary buds. Well, they have a primary bud with two clusters in each bud. When you see those large clusters, what you're actually seeing is the vine is expressing genetically that it has enough nutrients to um, express its largest clusters. I have a 50% reduction in the use of fungicides. My goal is zero a 38% reduction in the gallons to ton. And I will actually say about 15% of that was due to infrastructure improvement. But I can't separate those two, so it's hard to tell how much. I'm just guessing it's roughly half from regenerative and about half from infrastructure. Also because I have this kind of consistency, I plan more, I react less, I have more field and crew time, which is why I became a viticulturalist. I have more customer time, time to spend with my customers, it's increasing profits. I'm having way more fun. This is so much more fun than the old system of like spraying on a schedule and you know being freaked out about um, uh, trying to constantly correct problems. And I don't work on weekends much, you know, we still all do, but it's a lot less. So what's your tolerance for innovation? If you're an early adopter, you really want to ask why. A lot of people love innovation just for the sake of innovation. If you do it, be careful, do it on a small scale because it might work, it might not. I think most of us are right here. We're looking at that chasm between the early adopters. There's enough research to show that this is a good system. and You need to ask how. And the way you ask how is you ask for help. We look for systems, technology, and experience. And that includes folks like the RCD, the NRCS, Vineyard Team, Kind Harvest is another group. It's a, it's a, a web group, Regenerative Ag News. There's a lot of great resources out there. Um, whatever you do, don't listen to the coffee shop crowd and be really careful about taking advice from your dad. How to get started, have clear goals. Um, for wine grapes, it's not always yield. Uh, one thing to keep in mind about yield and quality is it's a perennial crop. The first year of your program, you're probably going to see very little change. In the second year, you'll see significant change. In the third year, you tend to see stabilized change. It's like any improvement in a vineyard. It tends to be a three-year cycle. For me, the big thing was less uh, variability. And on the quality issue is I'm defining quality by how my winery finds quality. Um, better yields, of course, just make economic sense, but it's the quality of the grapes that are the ultimate determinant here. Um, you also get a better lifestyle, better work balance, better community member. 
and better economics. I've been rich, I've been poor, rich is better. I suggest starting small, make mistakes on a small scale, look at your return on investment. Once you've got a small scale that works, scale up fast. Develop appropriate measurements. You don't have to measure a lot. Like I said, I'm a real fan of SAP analysis, but if there are other things you can do in your farm, including just going out and being observant, that works. Uh, make sure that you have a good record keeping system and you have good field observations. And in summary, um, I think regenerative ag may be the best system to build resilience to climate change and biotic stress. Um, it can perform both financially and environmentally. There is technology now that can assist. And there's also, I have to admit, I'm really impressed with what NRCS and RCD and the folks that are creating the, the infrastructure, how much they've embraced this and how ahead of the curve they are. And as a last thought, what we do to the environment, we do to ourselves for better, or for worse, and better is better. All right, so questions. Great, thank you, Greg. That was a, a really good presentation, uh, very to the point and dovetailed really nicely with Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jones' presentation. So thank you for that. Um, and thanks for bearing with the technical difficulties, but in the end we could hear and see everything. So that worked really well. And uh, my take home message is that improving soil health uh, it improves your grapes, your bottom line, and is fun. So I like that. Um, with that, we have about 15 minutes for question and answer. And Katie, if you could lead that, take it away. Sure. Thanks so much, Greg. I, I think there's a bit of a clarifying question that might be helpful for everybody. Um, just a, a quick difference uh, between industrial versus regenerative in some of these systems, I guess, particularly the um, viticultural systems? Um, well, you know, the industrial system is basically a system that happened post-World War II, where we started to look at soil as just a medium for carrying water-soluble nutrients versus the soil as a complex biotic system. And that's the primary shift. If you, if you look at it as a biological system, your perspective just changes. You know, one of the reasons why salt-based synthetic fertilizers work so well is they pretty much kill all the biology in the soil, and that biology has nutrients tied up in it. And so you get this flush of soluble nutrients. Over time, the, um, the soil's ability to make those nutrients available drops less and less. And you just get into this negative spiral as opposed to a regenerative or a biologically based system, you go into a positive spiral where the system not only is providing more nutrients, but it becomes more self-regulating. Um, I'll give you two ex specific examples, vineyard examples. I had an old block of Chardonnay that just had a terrible nematode problem, a uh, parasitic nematode problem. We just changed the soil organic matter, increased the overall biology with some compost and some cover crops, I introduced some beneficial nematodes and the problem just went away. I now have lots of nematodes, they're beneficial nematodes. Uh, the other one is I have an old block of Cabernet right against the restaurant that we really didn't want to pull out because it's a money maker as our Disneyland block as we call it, the one that people go out and visit. And it had red blotch and we just started foliar feeding and uh, fertigating that and getting the nutrient levels up and moving up that plant health pyramid that I talked about before and the red blotch stopped expressing. We just don't see the symptoms of red blotch anymore. I'm sure it's still in there. If I did a PCR, I'm sure I'd still pick up some red blotch, but it's not expressing the fruit's good quality. It's fine. Great, thanks. Nice to have those concrete examples too. Um, a couple of people have been asking about the SAP analysis. Can you explain your process for um, collecting samples and, and a little bit more detail on that, please. Absolutely. So SAP analysis is a relatively new, well, it's a refined technology. Currently, the two labs that I'm aware of that, that do that are, um, are um, uh, Regen Ag Labs in Oregon, which has just started doing it. And um, there's a company out in the Netherlands. Uh, um, 
it, it escapes me at the moment. I'll think about it in a second. But the basic process is you collect um, 100 grams of leaves, and they actually do a sap analysis. And that is the um, trade secret part from the lab um, as how to do that extraction. They're not testing tissue. They're actually testing sap. And it's not just the old plant sap material. The reason we do that two-week intervals is we, I want to get a consistent comparison. But the other thing is, if I send a sample out on Friday, I have results on Monday. And I can look at those results and then plan ahead. The reason why we do old leaf and new leaf is you can tell that if a plant is deficient in a material, it's gonna to tend to take any mobile nutrient that it can from the old leaves and move it up to the new leaves. And so it's a way of, um, of, of predicting where your nutrient deficiencies are gonna be. Also, if you have a history of it, I just know that I have iron, you know, uh, boron, copper deficiencies early in the season. Um, and so it's a way of anticipating those. Uh, the lab's name in um, the Netherlands called Nova Crop Health. The company that I do that with, which I would highly recommend as a very competent agricultural consulting company is, um, is um, <laughs> it's uh, John Kemp's company, um, uh, well, this is this, um, I will get to that in a minute. Oh, um, I'll, I'll think. Um, you can tap, type it in the chat later. <laughs> yeah, I'll type it in the chat. It's just, it's, it's even at the moment. Yeah, yeah, Greg, this is Keith. Can you just try real quick to see if you can turn your video on? Can I do what? Can you try turning your video on for one second? I thought my video was on. Okay, yeah, for, for some reason it's coming out blank. So carry on, all's good. Oh, um, the company's name is Advancing Eco Agriculture. Great. Um, Katie, can you see my video or is that is it blank for everyone? It, it is blank, but I think it's fine. We'll just, I know there's so many questions. I think that your, your voice is coming in loud and clear. <laughs> um, so here's a, a question about um, fertilization and, and what is your approach beyond um, you know, your traditional methods of applying NPK or, or what are some of the other ones that you end up having to nutrients you have to address? How do you address that? So I use the plant sap analysis as an indication of where I am having imbalances and issues. The first thing I would say about fertility in a fertility program is the very first thing you should stop doing is adding too much of things just because you think you should be adding them. Uh, nitrogen is the classic one. Grapes use very little nitrogen. Um, I also focus my fertility program in the fall. Um, one of the advantages of being in a warmer climate is I get anywhere from two to three months of photosynthetic capacity after I've harvested. And after you harvest, it creates a auxin cytokine shift in the plant, and the plant goes kind of into photosynthetic efficiency and storage mode. So that's, I usually do an extra foliar and a couple of fertigations. That's when I'm priming my soil to get the um, soil microbiology uh, going and you know, that's, that's, I push a lot more of my efforts into the fall because by the time you get bud burst in the spring, it's a little late and it's hard to get nutrients into a vine early in the season. Um, I use two primary methods. One is foliar for immediate uptake to correct short-term deficiencies. I am leaning much more towards fertigation, long-term slow fertigation, usually mixed with organic compounds like humic acid. Um, to try and prime that pump. Um, I think that's an important concept with regenerative ag is the foliars are meant to prime the photosynthetic capacity of the vine and your cover crop. So it has excess sugar to pump into the biological system that then turns on the rigid cycle that then makes the nutrients available. Um, that reference on rhizophagy is James White, I believe. Um, some fascinating work. I'd highly recommend doing a Google Scholar, James White, Rhizophagy, getting a nice good bottle of wine. That is definitely a full bottle of wine research project. 
Great, we'll make sure to get that in the chat too. Um, so someone's wondering uh, about that, there's so many different ways that you can analyze um, the soil microbial community. And mm -hmm. do you have recommendations for what you think is, is the most beneficial? Yeah, there's a couple. I mean, first and foremost is a shovel. It's just go out and dig, smell, look, feel, get the texture. There's a couple of cool NRCS videos. Ray Archuleta, I believe is his last name, who just does these cool things about um, soil infiltration and soil structure. Super easy tests that you can just do with a jar and a, a, and a mesh. Um, I am leaning much more towards the Haney soil analysis um, to do the respiration. Uh, for years, I was looking under a microscope. I studied with Elaine Ingham for a few years. I love her concepts. It's just counting bacteria and counting fungi. We're just, it's, it's slow. It was a real challenge to do. I still do it occasionally. I'll get a sample. What I'm looking for is how prolific the bacteria is and how prolific the fungi is. So those are kind of my main indicators. But one of the reasons I was talking about once you get the system going and you're doing less sort of emergency, you know, corrective issues, you have more time to spend in your vineyard. And you know, let's face it, that's why a lot of us got into this. We, it's fun to be out in the vineyard and it's fun to see those changes. Uh, last year, we got 14 inches, uh, excuse me, six inches of rain in 24 hours. And I was concerned that um, we would have some flooding in the vineyard. And so I went out to make sure the culverts were clear and they're actually dry. In those areas that we were developing good soil structures, it just absorbed all of it. And my neighbor's vineyard, who still sprays and discs four times a year and does the whole thing, there was literally vines running into the creek. You know, when you see those kinds of differences, that's when you know you're on the right track. Sure. Yeah, it looks like we, we might have time for one or two more questions. There's a couple of yeah, people- Yeah, I, I saw one question quick in the chat that I wanted yeah. to just, someone asked about the cost of EuroWatch. It's six sure. dollars per acre per year. It's super cheap. You said six? Six dollars per acre per year, yeah. Wow, <laughs> that is not much. <laughs> um, a couple people have asked about the reduction in um, fungicide use. And yes. How, how did that happen for you? And um, can you explain that a bit more? So two things, as the plants move up that plant health pyramid, they're just developing more of a natural resistance to fungal infection. The second is I spend much more time in canopy management is um, we are really, we hand prune everything now because I am so focused on good canopy management, good airflow. I want the fruit in that fruit zone, when I get that expression of the two primary apical buds, I get those two large clusters right in the fruit zone, and I have a large canopy over top of it protecting it. Uh, the other thing is I use an IPM approach, whereas I am looking at the Goobler powdery mildew index. It doesn't tell you everything, but it's a decent predictive tool. And once again, the most important tool I have is I know where my hot spots are. I go out and I start to look and when you see those early indications or you see the powdery mildew index go up, that's the time to go out and take corrective action, not on a regular schedule. Let's take one more question and then move to break. Thanks, Keith. Um, I guess just to wrap it up, um, someone's asking, I think this would be good for everyone. What do you think is one of the most important things you're doing? And would that be something you'd recommend for people who are trying to transition into more of a regenerative system? I think the most important thing I'm doing is thinking very differently. I am no longer thinking of my vineyard as a mechanical system, but I'm thinking of it as a biological system. Whenever I have something like powdery mildew or I have mealybugs or anything like that, I don't see it as an invasion. I see it as nature's way of being sort of garbage collectors, is I have a problem with my system, the garbage collector coming in to try and clean it up. So instead of fighting the garbage collectors, I ask, what's that underlying problem? Why doesn't this plant have its own natural abilities to uh, fend off powdery mildew or mealybugs or you know whatever it is? Um, a specific example of the mealybugs is I started using 
a uh, soil treatment that has a lot of uh, chitosan in it, you know, crab shed. And unbeknownst um, to me, it increased the chitosan bacteria in the soil and mealybugs go through a nymph stage where their outer shells are uh, made of chitosan. So the bacteria was eating the mealybug larva in the soil before they even emerged. Totally unexpected, but it worked great. And it's just a great example of how those kind of systems kick in. That's great. Thanks so much for sharing. And sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but please reach out to Greg or again, any of your local RCDs to hopefully try and get more of these answered. Yeah, Thanks again. more than happy. If anyone wants to reach out, it's greg at wilsoncreekwinery.com. We'd love to hear from folks. Thanks so much. Um, also, if you reach out, let me know where your winery is because I love hanging out with other winemakers and uh, tasting your wines.